Good evening. I am Inga Musselman, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the University of Texas at Dallas. ChatGPT was not used in the making of these remarks. <laughs> I'll let you decide if I needed it. On behalf of the university, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our campus. For those of you who are making your first visit, I hope you'll have opportunities for many more. If you enjoy the arts, you will want to be, uh, return when construction of the Edith and Peter O'Donnell Jr. Athenaeum is completed. It is an arts complex that will be a second location for the Crow Collection of Asian Art, as well as a performance space and museum. The fact that UT Dallas is becoming a hub for the arts may surprise you, but it is an important enhancement to our focus in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and management. We are committed to providing a full range of expression for human intellect and creativity. We serve more than 31,500 students who are pursuing degrees in courses and programs led by top scholars. One of our stated goals is to be a leader in both framing and answering questions faced by our community. That is why we have partnered with the Dallas Morning News to explore what Wired Magazine describes as the unstoppable march of generative artificial intelligence. I want to extend a special thanks to the Dallas Morning News for sponsoring tonight's discussion. Here with us from the Dallas Morning News are Amy Hollyfield, Managing Editor, Christopher Wynn, Arts and Entertainment Editor, and our moderator for this event is Aditi Ramakrishnan, a science reporter for the Dallas Morning News. Thank you all for your efforts to making this evening a success. When you entered the lecture hall this evening, you were given cards. You can use these to submit questions for the panel. Please hold on to the cards until the conclusion of the discussion when they will be picked up by staff. Depending on the time remaining in the program, some of the questions will be read aloud for res uh, responses from our panelists. With that, I am pleased to turn the podium over to Aditi Ramakrishnan, who will introduce our panelists and get the program underway. Thank you, and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Provost Musselman, and thank you all for being here. We're so excited to get this discussion started, and thank you to the panelists as well for being here. Um, my name is Aditi Ramakrishnan, and I'm a science reporter with the Dallas Morning News. So today we'll be talking about some of the facts and fictions of ChatGPT, but first I'm going to give just a quick overview of what this technology is and how it works so we can get into some of the ethical implications of it. So first of all, ChatGPT is a chatbot that was released by a company called OpenAI in November 2022, and it's a type of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is something that we already encounter pretty frequently in our daily lives from when we use Face ID to unlock our phones to when we're scrolling through social media and we see advertisements for bags and purses or phones that are tailored perfectly to our interests. But this specific chatbot is used to write poems, ad copy, social media posts, and more by trying to predict the next word. And the way that that works is if you ask ChatGPT, for example, to fill in the blank for a sentence like four score and seven years, what it does is it's been trained on a huge amount of information, including information from the internet, and it looks at all the data it's been trained on to figure out what the most likely word that goes next in that sentence is based on all the information it has. And so based on that, it would give you the answer four score and seven years ago. And I'm just going to go through two more quick examples of how this works. So in this example, I asked ChatGPT, who was the first president of the United States? And the answer it gave me was this, 
correctly, George Washington. And the answer that you see here is a couple sentences. Um, but basically, what ChatGPT did, to, GPT did to give me this answer was kind of looking at all of the information it's been trained on. Imagine if you typed in on Google who was the first president of the United States. The most likely way to finish up that question would be with George Washington. The answer that you see here, though, is not pulled directly from any source on the Internet. This is original content that ChatGPT generated word by word by trying to figure out what the most likely way to answer this question is. And then here's one final example that gets at some of the things that we might be worried about with this chatbot. In this example, I asked ChatGPT to write an email to me from UT Dallas asking me what day this panel is going to be. And here is the response I got back. It says, Dear Aditi Ramakrishnan, can you please let us know the date for the ChatGPT panel? We are looking forward to attending and want to ensure we have it marked on our calendar. So the first thing you might notice from this is that it does sound really conversational. It sounds like an email that I could have written. So it is able to kind of sound like a human could have written it. Um, that said, it definitely isn't fully complete. I had asked for the sender to be UT Dallas, which isn't included here. But similar to the examples we've talked about before, these kinds of responses are generated word by word by ChatGPT looking at all the information it has and thinking what's the best way to respond to this question. But a response like this does kind of get at some of the questions that you guys may be having, which we're going to talk about, which include, could ChatGPT be used to write students' papers or essays if it was able to write that email for me? And could chatbots like this learn to think or feel like we're used to seeing in the movies with robots and AI? And then finally, with AI, the goal of this technology is to create things that could be as smart as humans, and could this chatbot get us there? So these are some of the questions that we're going to be discussing today with our panelists, who are all wonderful professors at UT Dallas, which I'm happy to introduce. So first off, we have Professor Shania Du, who is an assistant professor of computer science at UT Dallas's Eric Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science. We have Dr. Gopal Gupta, a professor of computer science in the Eric Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, and who is also co-director of UTD Center for Applied AI and Machine Learning. We have Professor Dale McDonald, who is an Associate Dean of Research and Creative Technologies at the School of Arts, Humanities, and Technology at UT Dallas. And then lastly, we have Professor Jessica Oyang, who is an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at UT Dallas's Eric Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science. So. So with that, I'm excited to just get the discussion started. So the first question I have for our panelists is related to education. So teachers and educators might have concerns that students could use ChatGPT to write their papers for them. And so is that a legitimate concern? And what can teachers and educators do about this? So Dr. Gupta, would you like to start us off? Sure. So I guess it all depends on, like any tool, it all depends on the intent with which uh, the tool is used. So, of course, it can be abused, and I'm sure all of you heard, uh, I mean, are familiar with uh, chat GPT by now. You've seen the wonderful output that it can produce. So, a student could potentially use it for getting their homework done, but they can also use, uh, use chat GPT for generating samples that can help them, you know, see examples of good writing or, you know, whatever the homework that they're doing. So I guess it's a, I'd say, a double-edged sword. Um, now, with respect to if a student cheats, whether you can tell uh, that the student has cheated using chat GPT, I guess my colleagues here uh, probably can uh, tell better. But it's incredibly hard to actually tell that, indeed, the student has, been, has cheated using chat GPT. It can be a great tool for teachers, indeed, though I think it can help teachers quite a bit, I would say, uh, with respect to reduce maybe their workload and for generating examples and things like that. It's a wonderful tool. And of course, you know, during the course of the panel, we'll discuss its limitations as well and when, when we get to that point. So if anybody else wants to add. Um, so, yeah. so um, it, it kind of is becoming clear that it's, it's really important that teachers use it and get students to use it um, so that you can have a lot of these ethical conversations um, 
but also it it seems to provide a really good sounding board for working through um, developing ideas um, and it's a tool that that is insanely rapidly becoming ubiquitous and um, our students are going to have to have this literacy um, yeah I agree that sometimes uh, it's become more challenging for the educators to detect whether uh, the for example the essays are written by the students or written by chat GPT but there, um, but currently researchers in like natural language processing or other fields they are also developing tools for uh, detecting the plagiarism when the students are writing the essays um, but uh, I think from the uh, from the professor's perspective, um, we can also come up with uh, questions like um, that are more challenging. Like uh, we can ask the students to like um, read the diagrams or charts, which require more uh, understanding and reasoning capabilities to. Um, come up with answers and that's uh, in my understanding not doable for current uh, large language models which are only trained with mass uh, a large amount of textual data and from another perspective I think um, currently uh, since the uh, uh, the large language models they can come up with um, good answers or writing samples um, I think from the educator's perspective, they can also ask the students to like, um, write critics on, on top of the uh, AI-generated content and uh, ask the student to utilize it as tools and come up with even more creative uh, writings or answers. Yeah. yeah, I think as Dr. Du and Dr. Gupta mentioned, I think the best use of ChatGPT is as a brainstorming tool to assist you in writing. Um, and I also think that there's an opportunity here to use it as an educational tool for critical reading. Um, one of the limitations that we know ChatGPT has is that it can produce factual inconsistencies. So for example, it might switch the names of two characters from the book you're supposed to be writing an essay on. And unless you are critically reading the essay that it has written for you, you may not realize or notice that. Um, so I think it's a valuable lesson that you shouldn't always blindly believe everything you read. We know that it makes these kinds of errors. And so it's a good tool for students to, to practice on. And one could also, I mean, if the intent of, for example, the student is to cheat, then, I mean, even before ChatGPT came along, they could always go to Google and write search for things and maybe they'll find a direct hit for the essay that they're looking for. <laughs> So the bar, now in that case, you know, there are tools that are available that will look for uh, Turnitin and all those tools that will check if something has been plagiarized. So the bar is a little bit higher, but nevertheless, I mean, these, these uh, uh, students could, if they wanted to cheat, they could cheat earlier as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, in that sense, you know, things have not really changed that much, I would say. So we got to teach students to be more honest and use it as a tool to learn rather than tool to cheat. All right, so kind of based on what you guys are saying, there is a potential for students to use this to cheat, and it is more challenging for teachers to figure out whether an essay has been plagiarized, but this then could lead to some more educational opportunities to talk about what ChatGPT gets right and wrong, to even write more nuanced questions that maybe make it harder for students to use ChatGPT, and even pivot to using it as a brainstorming tool to kind of get started writing, to kind of pivot away from that approach. And Dr. Du, you kind of had an interesting perspective on how ChatGPT deals with numbers and reasoning. So I guess, would you mind explaining, I guess, how ChatGPT approaches mathematical problems and where that might be a limitation? Yeah, um, I think it's still challenging that people found that it's not good at like um, multiplications or simple additions, uh, especially their understanding for numbers. And this, I think apart from the mathematical reasoning problems, um, I personally also work on like uh, logical reasoning, common sense reasoning, and as well as uh, uh, just uh, like the uh, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. And I think from the my perspective, uh, the large models are um, 
as they uh, as the parameters grow, uh, they still fall short on like uh, the logical reasoning problems, um, especially when they become more uh, uh, like complicated. Uh, it's, uh, like if the reasoning path is like a tree structure, then it's um, the model seems to fall short on this type of more complicated reasoning task. Um, as for the common sense reasoning, I think uh, the models are beginning to grasp some uh, common sense uh, concepts, but uh, it's still hard for it to hard like uh, capturing the new concepts. Like you can't really uh, put an elephant in a refrigerator. And, um, also, uh, I think for the temporal reasoning capabilities, the large models um, are still limited. Like uh, the duration for this panel wouldn't be over one day, and it's still kind of hard for the models to capture this um, concept. Right, so kind of crunching numbers, complicated mathematical problems, and also kind of logical reasoning are two places where ChatGPT wouldn't be totally infallible if a student were to use it. For a... Yeah, so, so as you heard, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really a pattern matching tool. It's basically predicting what will be the next word based on, on you know, this corpus of text that's out there uh, on the web. So it's got absolutely no thinking. Any reasoning or any kind of logical inference that you see is happening is basically just emergent behavior, you could say by chance, because you know people said so. So in that sense, you know, these tools are, you know, are not going to be as good as us humans uh, because they cannot actually reason. Whatever reasoning or math capability that you see is just you know, happens to be there, you could say, by chance. So, uh, for example, if you ask ChatGPT, whatever tool you're using, large language model, uh, what is two plus two, then it says four because you know that's what's out there. If a lot of people had written two plus two is five, then ChatGPT might come and tell you that two plus two is five. So those limitations are always going to be there unless you know different technology is used. Because at the end of the day, it's a pattern matching tool. That's all it does. Well, it's pretty incredible what it can do. I mean, don't get me wrong. It can write poetry, generate uh, blogs, add, you know, all kinds of things. It's quite amazing that such a simple thing is so powerful. I think it's also important to remember that ChatGPT, as um, Dr. Du and Dr. Gupta have alluded, it works primarily on text. So to it, a number is not any different from a word. And so it doesn't do math, it remembers what it's seen other people say that happens to involve mathematical operations. Similarly, it doesn't have a representation of charts and tables or graphs or images. Um, and so anything that it is able to process or produce must be in the form of words. Um, and that's part of the limitation as well, that it does not have any other representations of the world. Yeah, and that definitely brings us really easily into our next question, which has to do with the idea of AI thinking and feeling. So one common concern with AI, like ChatGPT, is that it could learn to think or feel or love like humans do. There's a couple news articles out there about AIs like telling reporters or people that it loves them or wants to be alive. And so when we see things like that happening, what is going on there? And could AI as it stands right now learn to develop these human feelings? And Dr. Ouyang, would you like to start us off on that? Sure. Um, so I guess right off the bat, I should say no, don't worry. ChatGPT <laughs> is not going to develop sentience and come after us. Um, I think a very important example to keep in mind is that in the when ChatGPT was first put online, OpenAI, the company behind it, quickly discovered that when you talk to it, it um, it remembers the conversation that you're currently having. So it, it keeps a working memory of things that you, this particular user, have said to it in the past. And so as users would talk to it, and humans being what they are, they might be rude to it or say some mean things. And ChatGPT very quickly picked up on that and started being mean right back. And so OpenAI decided that this was not something they wanted to have happen. They did not want their product going around insulting the users. And so they implemented some uh, restrictions on what it was able to say that will shut down that kind of conversation very quickly. But that's not something that OpenAI, uh, or I'm sorry, that's not ChatGPT, that was OpenAI telling it, do not say these kinds of things. And because OpenAI is able to have that kind of control, it, it 
shows you that the things that ChatGPT are saying is like Dr. Gupta said, it's pattern matching. So as you treat it, it will sort of respond in kind. What did it see on the internet? Well, people on the internet are often abusive towards each other. And so it said, ah, I can see the conversation we're supposed to be having right now. It's this one where I insult you, as opposed to, oh, I've seen this conversation before. You declare your love for me, therefore I should declare it right back. Um, but it's not doing that because it has any internal representation of what it means. It's doing that because it's seen other people say that before. So it should also be mentioned that this large language models technology is actually, you know, most people heard about it once ChatGPT was released, which is what, November sometimes, and then I think what, in five days it had a million users. But large language models, as this technology is known, has been around for many years, uh, I think what, 2017, 2018, when the first uh, model was released. Um, so it's been there and people have been experimenting with it. Um, and in fact, you might remember when um, Google engineer was fired because he said that, you know, Google AI was sentient. It was basically this, you know, large, Google's large language model. So these companies, many of them did not release these models because, you know, they would, uh, you know, sort of go berserk. But chat GPT, open AI figured out how to control that behavior by hiring a lot of humans and sort of putting boundaries on it. And that's how chat GPT was released. And I mean, it just became so popular in, you know, such a little time. So for a six year old, it's mathematical literacy probably makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, but I, the, this notion that open AI is, is putting these guardrails on, um, and the question then is why? And it's because they've spent billions of dollars doing this and they want to make that back. So they can't have this thing be offensive. And when you cut off the possibilities of being offensive, you also cut off a lot of possibilities of being smart. Um, and I think that um, this, this is sort of the first big technology that came out of private industry, and um, and I think the motivations behind it um, should give us all pause um, in, in using it, uh, both for privacy concerns um, and um, for mm, propaganda concerns. So you can think of it, I, I mean, the way I look at it, you can think of it as a very precocious, maybe eight-year-old who is in the household listening to all the conversations, doesn't really have quite the experience and the knowledge to really make sense of them. But if you go and ask this, you know, precocious child something, give you an answer, and this answer is based on, you know, what this child has heard from the adults, but may or may not be right but it will sound right. And I think that's what you could say chat GPT is at a grand scale. Yeah, actually, I, I told, uh, if, you, if you prompt chat GPT, um, at least today, like what you can't do, you will say that it, it does not have emotions. <laughs> and uh, actually, from the technical perspective, um, um, a research field called alignment is fastly growing, uh, actually is also one of the key uh, research contributions uh, after ChatGPT, um, behind ChatGPT. Um, it, you, you see that sometime, um, or sometimes after its first release, people found that some of the outputs uh, by the ChatGPT are biased. But um, as time goes on, uh, it's being updated by some technique called reinforcement learning and from human feedback. So basically, uh, the researchers are trying to um, like utilize um, like users' queries and then do re-annotations or whatever behind the scene to um, to reiterate and modify the model's behaviors and make it uh, align better with human values. But um, in summary, or after it does not have emotions. Yeah, those are all really important points and relieving also to hear that I guess for one, ChatGPT 
can't love necessarily, and it's kind of parroting back what it's you know seen based on the data that it's been trained on. And Professor McDonald, you brought up an interesting point too about the con the converse of that hate and the fact that I guess people may even talk to AI in a way that we don't even really talk to each other. And so I guess what are some of the implications of that, I guess, for AI learning biases or discrimination? I guess what are some of the, on the other side of love, what are some of the dangers there? Well, it, 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 it um, you know, has already shown itself capable of, of wandering off into very strange corners, but and and with the latest crop of these tools, um, again, a lot of work has been done to make them not offensive, and and the 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 really interesting move was to keep it contained, as Dr. Ruyang was saying, um, to the conversation it's having with you right now, um, rather than having everyone's conversation influence your conversation. Um, and that's, that's a big safety rail um, uh, that I think has, has helped this be a lot more palatable. I think it's also important to remember that all machine learning models are, by definition, trained on data, and that data is produced by society, and society produces biased data. It's just how we are. Um, so all machine learning models contain some amount of bias, and there's a lot of work on ways to try to mitigate that bias, but it usually involves, um, in some way, editing the data. Um, so a good example is that um, the representation of text used in these kinds of models are a, uh, a type of representation called word embeddings, and it was found that most commonly used word embeddings tend to associate the word woman strongly with homemaker in the same way it associates the word man with doctor. So these biases are out there in the data and the model just, it doesn't understand, it just associates them, it matches patterns. Um, and so this is not unique to ChatGPT either, although I think with the um, far-reaching applications of ChatGPT, it might affect people who were not previously affected by it. It's a really great point that a lot of times we think of these artificial intelligence as these kind of like sentient robots, but at the end of the day, they're trained and created by humans. And so a lot of times they reflect some of the same biases that we as a society have too. And it's important to keep in mind when we're designing these new things. Yeah, see, that's one of the challenges that really doesn't have awareness. It you know, doesn't know its boundaries. And I think that's in general the problem with the machine learning technology that, you know, it sort of, you know, you give it examples and it learns the functions function that will map inputs to outputs. But then it really, even if you give it some input that it has not seen before, it'll still try to predict um, the uh, some output. And so, for example, if you ask who won the Nobel Prize in 1680, it might say uh, Isaac Newton, for instance, uh, because all its you know, it knows about the Nobel Prize, but it doesn't really know, and that scientists win it, and, you know, Newton was a prominent scientist in the 1600s, and so he, so, so these are some of the issues that are probably hard to eliminate. And there's also the issue of the design of the chat side of this, and the fact that these machines refer to themselves in the first person. Um, I am just this, and while, while denying their, their being anything but a large language model, they still say I. Um, and so that, that's a manipulation by the designers to get you to better engage with, with the tools. Um, but it sets up a relationship with the tools that is unrealistic. <laughs> no. Well, I was going to say talking about the limitations leads pretty well into our next question, which has to do with kind of the idea that we're creating our artificial intelligence to create this, these systems that could one day be just as good as humans, replace human creations, human ideas. And so with ChatGPT, can that get us to that point? And if not, I guess, what will it take to get to that point? And Dr. Du, do you want to start off with that? Yeah. Um... I think currently, at least for ChatGPT, it's only handling text. 
Yeah, also like OpenAI recently released GPT-4, uh, which is a improved version of GPT-3. It's uh, able to handle like multimodal information based on both text and images. Um, but I think there's still a lot of space to explore. Like for ChatGPT, we can, uh, it's, it's like currently like a black box and we still need more interpretability and improve its robustness, especially like when you change the prompts even a little, like um, if you have a type, include a typo in the prompt, it's giving you a totally different uh, outputs. And I think from another perspective, uh, even if it ha can handle like images, because there are plenty of text and images online, you, you still, uh, it still needs to interact with the real world, like gaining the physical knowledge and the real interactions with human beings. And I think they are all uh, directions to go uh, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, say that with respect to creative aspects, I mean, it's a wonderful tool, uh, Chat GPT, because, you know, if, if you're interested in creative things, you know, create poems, it can combine ideas that are already out there, it can generate hypotheses. So for all those things, it really is a is a great tool. Uh, so, uh, so despite its limitations, so maybe, you know, it can combine results in five medical journal papers and come up with some you know new diagnosis or new treatment plan or something so in that aspect as as a hypothesis generator it can actually be quite useful uh, but it still it still has to be uh, you know sort of work as a human assistant because it's got a long way to go because if you you know look at you know what is what intelligent behavior is you know for example in us humans then intelligent behavior essentially consists of both being able to learn, you know, look at patterns and then generalize from these patterns and uh, learn something, as well as be able to reason with the information that we get out of this learning process. So chat GPT, GPT-4, whatever, they're good at the learning part, pattern match, and then they use that for pattern matching, but not so good with respect to our, you know, there is no reasoning aspect at all. And the reason we humans sit at the top of the food chain is because we have both capabilities. I mean, there are, there are animals, for example, that have better sensing abilities. I mean, dogs can smell better, and, and that's equivalent to sort of machine learning. Uh, eagles can see better, but they don't have the reasoning capability. And the reason, as I said, you know, we sit at the top of the food chain is because we can reason as well not only learn, but we can reason. So unless we really uh, add reasoning capabilities on top, uh, it's very hard for something like GPT-3 or GPT-4 or chat GPT to rival human capabilities. I mean, it can certainly perform very well when it comes to uh, a pattern matching task, but you know, in terms of general intelligence, uh, it's still got a long way, we still got a long way to go. A very common thing I've been seeing in the last three weeks, as this thing rushes to press, um, is AI is not going to replace your job. A human who can use AI is going to replace your job. <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it can improve product. I mean, it's a great tool for improving productivity in that sense. You know, it's, it's like I would call it, in fact, it, it's interesting thing is that it's the white collar jobs that are, you know, more uh, threatened than blue collar jobs with this technology. And so I'd say, you know, this is uh, instead of uh, uh, industrial automation, it is intellectual automation that, that is happening. And so a lot of these intellectual jobs are going to be automated. You know, generate a draft for a letter. You know, it can generate it for you and then you can edit it or, you know, generate a blog post or generate a report with these constraints and it will do it for you. So intellectual automation rather than industrial automation. But I think it's also important to keep in mind, as Dr. Gupta is alluding, that you have, it's an assistant to a human. It is not doing the job by itself. Um, and one of the key limitations of all machine learning models is that they are always giving the most probable answer at all times. 
So unlike a human who might make a mistake and later realize that they've made a mistake, these models are not capable of doing that. So it firmly, and I, I hesitate to use the word to anthropomorphize this thing further, but it believes very strongly that its answer is correct and it cannot believe otherwise. Um, so uh, Dr. Gupta mentioned, for example, hypotheses on new treatments in medicine. Well, I would certainly hope before anyone tried that on me that a human has checked the work and made sure it was okay um, because the model thinks it's right, always thinks it's right, and is not capable of thinking otherwise. And I guess one thing, too, is we kind of talked about the idea of could AI evolving to potentially, I guess, perform human jobs, could that promote even, like, I guess, the jobs that we think of now to evolve as well? You guys were talking about kind of the industrial automation and kind of going from carriage drivers to cars, I guess. Is there a potential for a similar kind of evolution in the way that we think of jobs as well with AI? So, I mean, certainly it's going to improve our productivity. So in that sense, I think it's a great tool. So, so I was at another panel where a panelist observed that if you look at the history of the last 250 years, then as new technologies have come along, I mean, they've really only increased the number of jobs rather than, you know, replace uh, people. That is true of, you know, automation of agriculture where, right, 80% of the people were doing agriculture and now it's less than 1% and, and also, you know, could say the web, uh, electricity, all kinds of things, you know, that uh, candle makers are out of job because electric bulb has been invented. So in that sense, I think it's not going to replace people that I would predict that there are going to be more jobs actually than, you know, the number of jobs that are going to be gone. Of course, the skill level that is needed to do these jobs will probably keep going up. Uh, so universities will play a very central role, like UTD. Uh, but I, I see that the number of jobs will actually go up, is what I predict, or what I think. I think a, another interesting way to use ChatGPT is this conversational style. So you can, um, if you've played with it, you can correct it. So if it gives you a response and you don't really like it, you can ask it to try again. If it gives you a response and you like it, but you want it a little different, you can ask it to make a small change. Um, so it really is a cooperative process to get the best possible output out of these models. Um, it does what's called in-context learning, where the human is giving it guidance, and because it remembers the whole conversation, it will slowly sort of meander towards the thing that you're trying to get it to do, even if it doesn't get it right on the first shot. Um, so it's really, it, it should be used as a partnership, not as a standalone tool. Yeah, there's there's a big new industry to come, and that... The, Microsoft and, and Google are certainly talking about is how to design interfaces that um, encourage and allow collaboration. And in this case, instead of with other humans, um, it's with a large learning model, <coughs> language model. Um, but the other place where I, there's already growth in jobs and will probably be more um, and is a great place for exploitation is in annotation and in making these things smarter. Um, you just you have to have people looking at the, the output of it and commenting on it. And there's reinforcement learning going on as a result of that. Um, that's happening a lot as piecework, um, and piecework always ends up being not paid very well. And, uh, so I think there's there's a risk to society in, in a rapid expansion of that to accommodate the myriad of large language models that are now hitting the streets. Yeah, uh, in terms of replacing the jobs, I agree with the Dr. Gopal that it's uh, more acting as a helper and in boosting the efficiency of different uh, workers. For example, there's a field going um, fastly growing in NLP. It's the human in the loop NLP. Like uh, when you are writing a long document, it's better uh, they, the researchers come up with a concept like uh, we can write a long document with human in the loop. And that, that's a two uh, direction. Uh, I mean, that I think that's bi directional. Uh, for, from one way, uh, humans are 
improving or giving feedbacks uh, during this writing process. While the, uh, the NLP model is also providing like insights during the writing or correcting the grammar, uh, grammatical uh, problems. Um, and so I think it's more acting like, like a helper and especially like in the medicine domain. Uh, also in the financial domain, uh, as we just discussed that the large language models are not good at calculations or handling the numbers. So it's uh, really depend, uh, finally it really depends on like the uh, financial an an analysis to get the final decisions which might uh, affect a lot of downstream tasks. We can't really rely on the AI models to handle this uh, calculations or uh, important analysis. Yeah. So from what you guys all are saying, ChatGPT or other AI isn't at a point yet where we could trust it to make medical decisions for us or crunch financial numbers for us, but it could be at a point where maybe it could create more of a human role in those jobs to kind of check this technology and make sure that it's doing what it's been trained to do and kind of keeping an eye on it as things progress. And another thing that we haven't talked about yet is some, some of the kind of ethics around technology like this. So we talked about ChatGPT being trained on this insane amount of knowledge, information, information on the internet. And so basic, like what, how much energy does it take to run a chatbot like this? And who has the resources to pay to keep something like this updated? And what does that mean for us? Professor McDonald, would you like to start us off on that one? Sure. Um... So yeah, the, lots of, of guesses about how many 747s it takes to generate these, the train the model. Um, but I, there's already evidence that, that people are doing a lot of smart things to um, reduce that footprint um, that probably won't be as whizzy as GPT-4, um, but will get a lot of jobs done. <coughs> um, it, uh, again, it's the, the, you know, four or five very large corporations um, and apparently China Incorporated um, working at this, so there's there's what is their motivation? What guardrails are they going to put up? What kinds of manipulation are they going to do to users? Um, and um, yeah, how how do the finances of this work? Um, is is a, I mean, they're spending a lot of money and they're going to want to make it back. So how does that happen? Um, I mean, as far as the 747s, um, there was a model that came out several years ago. Um, these machine learning models, uh, we measure their size and what are called parameters. Um, exactly what that means is maybe not um, necessary to understand that it's just a measurement of size, so more is bigger. Um, and a model that was, I believe, 10 million parameters in um, 2017, I think it was, that they did this study, uh, training that model was equivalent to flying one fully loaded jumbo jet from New York to LA and back. Now, ChatGPT is 174 billion parameters, so it's not exactly linear, but you can certainly see that it's a very, uh, very large increase, um, hence why we call them large language models. So there is a lot of environmental concerns with the carbon footprint of training these models. The amount of electricity they use is staggering. Um, and like Dr. McDonald said, it's currently in the hands of corporations because no one else can afford to do this. Um, and whether or not that's something we're okay with, I think is something we'll find out from the machine learning community in the months to come. Yeah, um, in, terms of, in terms of the competitions between large corporations and uh, also the comparisons of uh, computation power between um, industry and um, academic institutes, uh, for example, I think for the large corporations, even running like the inference of the models, uh, they need at least over 10,000 uh, GPUs. And GPUs, it's like one unit of computation, no machine. Well, as uh, 
So research labs, at least in my labs, we have like less than 10 GPUs. But this, um, so you there's- You have 10? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the number scale is like 10 to like 10,000. Uh, I think um, there's a huge difference in terms of computation power, but, um, uh, but that leads to some types of uh, privacy and security concerns because if we if people always need the APIs from large in, uh, corporations, uh, they need to upload their data to the cloud, and that might re release their private private and secure information. But um, there are currently also uh, researchers uh, researchers studying the how to avoid these issues like um, uh, the security the security and private AI. Like you first in um, you first change the text into another format and then uh, upload it to the cloud. But that's encrypt uh, encrypted, so it's more secure. And uh, that's a research direction as well. So another, another interesting aspect is that the internet has been governed by this article 230, which basically says, I'm sure you've heard of it, which essentially says that platforms are not responsible for the content that you know is published on the platform, on their platform. So, if something says and something nasty on Facebook, then Facebook is or Meta now is not responsible. So then the question comes: you know, if ChatGPT gives some uh, you know wrong advice, bad advice, or uh, is offensive or whatever, does some harm, then who's responsible? So that becomes a, a harder question. So I guess you know maybe at some point uh, this discussion has to take place. How the art, how Article 230 should it be changed? Should it be adapted for you know this new reality? Yeah, a lot of great points there to think about. One about just the energy cost of running a huge chatbot like this that has, is trained on so much information. Then also thinking about I guess corporations that have the tools to run something like this and what that could mean for us. And um, we have time for just one or two more questions, and then we're also going to be moving to the audience questions. So I also just wanted to say that if you have a question that you wrote it on your note card, if you could pass that to the aisles, um, there'll be people there to take those from you, and then we'll be able to answer some of the audience questions as well. Um, but while you that, do that, um, I'll ask another question, which is that we talked about um, what ChatGPT looks like right now. I'm curious for you guys what you see AI looking like in the next five to 10 years, where do you see technology like ChatGPT going in the years to come? Dr. Gupta, do you wanna Okay, so that? sure, so, so in fact, that's what we do in our lab, which is try to build systems that can emulate humans. So the way I see it is that, you know, um, ChatGPT or GPT-4, GPT-3, large language models uh, can be thought of as, you know, they're great tools for actually figuring out the meaning of a sentence. So if you think about how, how, you know, how do we understand text? So we listen to a sentence or utterance from someone else, and then we first understand the meaning of that sentence. And then we use our own knowledge and our reasoning capabilities to draw inferences or even figure out that this information is wrong or right. So, uh, so, from my point of view, I think one of the best uses of uses of uh, large language model technology is to extract the meaning of the sentence. And there, it's. I, I think most of the time, you can actually get. So we've seen in our lab that you get more than ninety percent accuracy, but with a little bit more effort, you can do better. And then, so extract the knowledge in some formal notation from the sentence, and then process it using you know, uh, additional knowledge or using reasoning. So that's where I see one of the biggest uses of uh, large language models. And I think at some point, you know, we'll get to a point where the large language models are used for this purpose. And then you have a reasoner sitting on top that can perform, you know, reasoning like we humans can do using our common sense knowledge. And that's how we can reach build systems that are, you know, as good as us, but that's still, you know, further away. So in, in probably, you know, I'd say 10 years we might get there or, or less, but we're gonna get there. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, so 
in five to ten years, I think um, the topic for uh, definitely the, la the large language models will become better with uh, either human feedback or a stronger base models. Um, but from another perspective that I mentioned, the models still need to interact with the world to gain like the physical knowledge and be um, like increase the in like in the the field is called embodied AI, because uh, currently you can't really uh, directly call a robot to finish really complicated tasks. So language is the important perspective, but it also needs to interact with the physical world. Um, and secondly, I think uh, the evaluations is also important. Um, currently, the AIs might be uh, the AIs or large language models might be able to pass like the exams, but that's only one perspective. What, what about like culturally and socially adapted uh, NLP systems, and they are still harder to, to uh, being evaluated. Um, yeah, they are my points. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see um, whether whether these become as useful as people are currently claiming and become useful enough that it is a sustainable business. And I think that's a huge question right now. Um, and or will this just be the next shiny thing? Um, you know, we've we've quickly gone from XR to metaverse now to large language models in a very short period of time. So people's attention drifts. Um, this is still in a very high hype state, um, and uh, until people come up with actually good reasons to use it, um, it, it may not bear the investment. So from, I, I agree with what everyone else has said, that there are many tasks or fields where ChatGPT simply, in its current state, is not applicable. Um, if you wanted, for example, a model that was going to do complex mathematical calculations, that would be a different model. You couldn't train it the same way you did ChatGPT. So I think there's room for growth in these kinds of boutique models where perhaps your business has a very specific niche and you would like a model that is tailored to your customers, to your task, that will do the thing that you want and that doesn't involve you giving all of your customers information to OpenAI. Um, so I think that's definitely an area for development that what I guess we must now call small language models, although they didn't used to seem so small, um, still have a use for custom models. Um, because as we mentioned, ChatGPT is so large that no one can really retrain it. You just use it the way that it is. Um, and I think another thing is that ChatGPT really has not solved many of the problems that previously existed in natural language processing. So as an example, I work in text summarization, so basically I generate book reports. Um, but doing that automatically is challenging because it's very difficult for the models to keep track of all of the different people that are in a news article, for example. So one recent thing that I saw in my own work was that we were trying to summarize a news article about a Swedish politician who was announcing that someone had been released who had been kidnapped, so some hostage was released. And the model conflated all of these people into one and said that the Swedish foreign minister announced that she had just been freed from her own kidnapping, which was clearly wrong. Um, and so then I said, okay, cool. I fed that to ChatGPT and I said, here's the article, here's the summary that my model predicted. Is it correct? Did, is there anything wrong with this? And it said, no, A-okay. So none of the problems that previously existed have really been solved. So I think many of the things that we were previously trying to do to improve the performance and importantly, the factual correctness of AI models is uh, still a direction that we need to focus on. And, and, and for that, we have to bring in the reasoning component because that reasoning part, we're able to tell if the information that chat GPT is producing, is it correct or not? You know. So, so chat GPT sort of lacks awareness, as I said. So that, that knowledge has to be there, and that reasoning has to be performed to really check um, that what it said is correct or 
inconsistent or whatever. So, so in my in my so the holy grail of AI sort of to produce this what's called uh, artificial general intelligence, where we have systems that are as good as humans, and so certainly these large language models will play an important role uh, in reaching that goal. Uh, but it will be some more time. So, so in my own lab, we're actually experimenting. You know, we're thrilled that these large language models have been made available. So we're actually using them. So my own research is in automating sort of, you know, the human thought process, common sense reasoning. So we can take these large language models and extract the knowledge and then build chatbots that can actually understand what you're saying and then figure out if what you said is incorrect and what is missing and, and ask you for that information and then maybe reach a goal. These are very domain specific, they're task specific, but nevertheless, you know, uh, LLMs can be put to good use. Those are all great insights, and we have just a few minutes before we'll move to audience questions. So I just have one quick last question for you guys, which is that we talked a lot about some of the limitations of ChatGPT and where it might not be as successful. But I'm curious for you guys, where can it be useful, and how do you guys use ChatGPT in your work or research, if at all? And Dr. Oyang, so, do you want to start if, if you do? Sure. Um, so like I mentioned in my previous example, we've been using ChatGPT as a almost as a filtering step on the output of our own models. So um, in a lot of natural language processing research, you need human judges to check the output of your model and decide if it's good or bad. Um, but as you can imagine, getting a bunch of people willing to read a bunch of newspaper article summaries is kind of hard because they think it's boring. Um, and so if I asked you to read 200 articles and tell me good or bad, you probably wouldn't want to do that, especially because we're an academic lab and we can't afford to pay you very much. Um, so we've been using ChatGPT to screen. Um, so we first ask it, hey, does this summary look okay? Here's the input article, here's the summary we generated. What do you think on a scale from one to five, good or bad? And it'll generate something and then we, if it says it's really good or really bad, we say it's probably right. Um, and if it says something in the middle, then maybe I want a human to take a closer look and decide, is there anything wrong with this summary? So. That's something I've been using for in my work. Um, and then in my personal life, I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and so I use it to help me come up with ideas of how to kill my players. <laughs> so, so, so I mentioned um, using uh, these large language models to build these chatbots that can actually understand uh, what you're saying, a human is saying, and uh, so for, for narrow, uh, domain specific tasks so for example uh, so actually we have already built these things where you know you can uh, build a hotel concierge who advises you about a, you know which restaurant you should go to so you can actually come and ask go to this concierge uh, built using large language model technology plus you know our own automated common sense reasoning uh, engine you can ask the hotel concierge you know would you recommend what I'm interested in eating out, and would you recommend a restaurant? It'll ask you what kind of food you like, and what's your budget, and whether you want a family-friendly place or not, and then actually give you a recommendation based on the knowledge of, of area restaurant that it, it has. So we can immediately build these these systems, uh, domain-specific though, that uh, that can actually uh, really help people, and based on really understanding what you're saying. And these large language models play an important role. So if you're interested, a lot of this stuff is on my homepage. Google my name and find them. Yeah, um, in terms of applications, from my uh, from my perspective, firstly, it can, I mostly use it as a writing helper, uh, both for the like the grant writing helped me to brainstorm with the recent literature and I also use it to summarize the most recent papers because you know that there are like a uh, hundred papers every day appearing on some platforms which, uh, related to my research topic. And I, I can't really read them one by one so I filter them by the titles that, are, that got my interest or most res related to my research. And then I got the ChatGPT to like um, give me the summary for their contributions or what's um, what I can learn from the papers. And secondly, from also the writing helper, for example, if I uh, or my students they forgot certain pieces of code, 
I I just use it this afternoon to tell me how to write the piece of code to like convert a web page to a PDF file because I want to take notes or put some notes on the PDF file in terms of like uh, instead of like looking into the web page uh, every time and um, from the bigger perspective I think for science like interdisciplinary science they, they are also really important like there is a growing field called AI for science like you can't really use ChatGPT directly for a studying like climate change or st drug discovery, and that still requires a lot of you know, interdisciplinary collaborations. But that would be a really great tool for the different uh, researchers. ChatGPT is really good at um, sort of stylistic modulation um, and so one one place where this I think becomes very interesting is um, in museum design um, where you're trying to address um, ages 5 to 95 um, and and a wide variety of educational backgrounds so you can provide didactic information specific to the person who's looking at it, um, which is a very hard problem in, in museum world, um, and this just lets you do it on the fly, really. Um, and then um, the, the user experience community is finding it really useful for um, designing experiments and, and work and ways of working with clients to figure out what they really need. I think there are already two dozen books on Amazon that have been written with the help of chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just then we talked about a ton of potential uses for it, ranging from Dungeons and Dragons to reviewing scientific papers. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all so much for your responses to those questions. And now we're going to take some of the audience questions as well. And whichever one of you guys feels comfortable answering, just feel free to jump right in. So the first question we have is, tell us more about GPT-4. So, so I think what I have read uh, is, it's very recent, right? What, maybe four days ago, three days ago, uh, that it was released where it's it's multimodal it knows it can essentially understand pictures and so if you have for example a something you know hanging on a uh, hanging from the ceiling a, let's say a basketball hanging from the ceiling with a thread or something and there is a seesaw below and then you ask what will happen if we cut the string mm -hmm. it can answer that the that you know the seesaw will bounce things like that so so I, and it's got more parameters as dr uyan Dr. Du will tell you, I don't know how many, but certainly more than 100, way more than 174 billion parameters. And so it can do much more stuff than chat GPT. And to that lack of knowledge, um, OpenAI has become even less open with the release of GPT-4. Um, they aren't telling us how many parameters it is. They aren't telling us where they got the data to train. Um, and they explicitly say this is because of the competitive climate um, and that they need to make their money. Yeah, uh, I, I agree that they explicitly mentioned even on the, I think on the first page that they, they can't re really release the details like how many parameters or the basic architectures or uh, like their training details for the models because of the competitive uh, fields like they are competing with like large companies with Google or other uh, places. Um, but I think in my impression, uh, apart from the like the competitive literature problem, uh, I think the one com um, problem that they addressed is they try to make 
GPT-2 align better with human values, and that is done through reinforcement learning and instruction learning. It's, I think they utilize the, but they didn't really, really release the details on how they were doing this or with human feedback. But um, they, uh, the hypothesis is that they utilize the queries to either chat GPT or their internal queries and made the, and then created the response uh, based on certain rules that they created. They want the response to be less biased and also um, not so reservative. So you can see if you have access to the GPT-4 report, they actually um, mentioned it aligns better with human values and less biased and um, producing less heat speech and also more factual correct. But uh, that and their starting point is that even if it's aligned better with human value, uh, this is not sacrificing the model's capabilities for like passing the exams or NLP tasks. And that's interesting to me. Yeah. So speaking of passing exams, I think they reported in the paper, if you Google it, you'll find it, the paper on GPT-4, I think it's got 163 on LSAT, uh, and, and uh, five on several AP tests and pass, pass the bar. <laughs> yeah, S SAT score of fifteen hundred something, which is quite incredible. So it's incredible what you know, pattern matching can do. It's amazing. But of course, there's a lot of practice exams online that it has read all of them. Yeah. <laughs> the next question that we have is: since all of this is based on data, what is the impact that this could have on data privacy? So that's an interesting, I think there are already uh, lawsuits against uh, DAL-E system that the artists are very concerned because I think these some of these generative AI systems, so DAL-E is a system that will you give it a description, it has seen you know a lot of the pictures and paintings and you give it a, a, a textual description and it will draw a painting you know that conforms to what you said. And so the artists are all very concerned that, you know, it's basically ingested all their paintings and their artwork, and then it's using it to, so I guess we have to visit, revisit sort of the, you know, the copyright laws. Um, so yeah, it's uh, going to be an interesting world. Yeah, Google and Microsoft have both been very explicit that customer data won't be used for training. We'll see. <laughs> I saw today, actually, um, someone released a project called, I think it's called Glaze, um, with exactly this um, art generation problem where you can basically um, adversarially insert some um, undetectable to the human eye perturbations in your pictures, and then if someone ingests your picture to try to train their model, it comes out completely messed up. Um, and Dr. Dew sort of alluded to this where these models can be extremely sensitive to what would be to a human a very small, seemingly trivial difference in the input, um, but it's taking advantage of that to prevent um, you know, AI from stealing your artwork. Um, in my own work, I, I have a collaboration with some psychologists um, evaluating the quality of therapy sessions, and as you can imagine, they were very adamant that we don't try any chat GPT um, with their data because of the privacy issues of the patients who are in these therapy session transcripts. So in any um, situation where you are not comfortable with that data potentially going you don't know where, um, I would be very hesitant to, to use these kinds of technologies. It's unlikely that OpenAI has someone there looking at all of your data, you know, um, that some person has found out all the the details of your life, but do you really want to take that risk? It's now in their model somewhere. Yeah, but all the data, I mean, that you put in is out there in the sense that, so, we, you know, personal experience, I part, my students and I participated in this competition organized by Amazon where we're supposed to build a social bar that could hold a conversation on Alexa. So you could go to Alexa and say, let's chat, and, you know, it would bring one of the university bars and then you could talk about movies, sports, and things like that. So as we were building the tool, Amazon would actually give us access. So every day users will, people will use our system, and then next day, you know, we will look at the conversations that, you know, they held. 
and we would use those to improve our system. And it's incredible. I mean, everything that anyone said was actually available on an SQL, SQL searchable database. So every sentence, so when you, be careful when you, you know, say things to Alexa or, you know, your Google device or whatever. Everything you say is there in a database that is searchable, you know, uh, uh, in a structured way. So we don't know, you know, where this is going to go with respect to privacy. Certainly be aware that everything you say is, you know, available to the, you know, the system developers. I honestly had not thought about that either, so that's a great point. And our next question is that since ChatGPT can generate code easily, is it a threat to developers and are future jobs for de developers under risk? Uh, so again, it's a great assistant. I mean, you if somebody gave you, you know, the starting code, uh, then it would be wonderful that you just modify it. Um, so yeah, so I think it's it will help in improving productivity is what I would say. So ChatGPT has been trained on all the code that resides on GitHub and other uh, sites. And also there are many people complaining about it that, you know, their code was used for this purpose without their knowledge. Uh, so it can actually write code as well. And, but again, you know, you have to look at the code and make sure that it works correctly. I mean, it's incredible again what it can do, but still human input is needed. So it's a great assistant, again, you know, great helper. And as you I'd start say. adding more constraints too, so, you know, maybe I want this code to run on a cell phone. And so the amount of memory available is limited, for example. So if you ask it to write some code and then you keep adding more and more constraints for your one very specific application, it may or may not actually be able to tailor it that specifically. And then like Dr. Gupta said, you would need to check to make sure that it's actually fulfilling all your requirements. Anything it generates, you have to check basically. So unless it's something, you know, like a poem or something creative that it doesn't matter what it says, you know, if it says something crazy, then it's even better. <laughs> Otherwise you have to check. Yeah. It's not something that's open to interpretation. You still need somebody to right, go in there right. and make sure it's right. We have another interesting question, which is what are the potentials that AI like chat GPT could be used as social companions to the elderly and lonely people and ever offer mental health advice? That's certainly predicted as, as a common use. Um, and you already have Snapchat letting you add it as a friend. Um, and, and you can exchange messages with it through Snapchat. And um, you know, a, a lot of this started with Eliza. And so the notions of, of this conversation as therapy uh, has been around a long time and and is certainly going to get used that way. Um, whether medically sanctioned or not. <laughs> so, so those of you who may not know about ELISA, this is a program that was actually written in the 60s. And this actually fits in one page almost. And what it did was, uh, was I think Ed Feigenbaum who wrote it, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And, and so, um, what it will do is it will, you know, whatever you say or you type, it will take that and sort of, you know, just syntactically change it a little bit and, you know, push it back to you. And people would talk to it for hours and they really thought they were talking to a human when it was actually just something very simple. Uh, you know, that was just, you know, uh, slightly changing the sentence that they were writing. Uh, and as I said, you know, the program actually fits in one page. Uh, so something that simple could be used for therapy, then I don't know, you know, maybe something like chat GPT, <laughs> the sky's the limit for as, as a, you know, a friend or something that you can talk to. I think Eliza too was helped by the, Eliza was supposed to be a psychologist. And so when you would say, oh, I'm so mad at my mom, it would say, tell me more about your mom. And that's the kind of things that it would say. So you really didn't need that much input from the psychiatrist, Eliza. Um, but yeah, people, I think the, it was, um, the developer had his secretary as his sort of test subject and she would make him leave the room when he, when she talked to Eliza because it was private and she felt that strongly about how real that conversation was. 
And of course, it's all in, you know, the user's mind. I mean, if you really feel that, you know, you're talking to a, a, a you know, quote unquote person, then, you know, may continue with the conversation. But if you feel there's really a machine and then, you know, you may not be interested in such a companion. It probably depends on the person. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting point, Dr. Gupta, because ChatGPT and GPT-3, um, in terms of quantitative metrics that we usually use to measure performance on natural language processing tasks, they are not the state-of-the-art model, but they are strongly preferred by human users because of how personable they seem. Um, so I think the the human-like or human-seeming-like nature of ChatGPT is a large part of its appeal. Well, I, I think firstly um, we still need domain experts like psychiatrists to lead or provide uh, guidance for the large models to be capable or better at doing this, uh, conducting these conversations. And also, I think an interesting research now is to how do we make the large language models to be personalized. I think it is definitely important for this application. Um, so if we have the individualized or personalized uh, large language models, it would be helpful or uh, make it more appealing for the, these applications to be a companion for the um, elderly. Yeah. yeah, all great points and interesting to think about, yeah, that the reason that we really resonate with chatbots like this one is that it is conversational and it's seemingly human-like, so interesting to think about. In fact, that's what one of the things, you know, around chat GPT, it was based on GPT-3, uh, that the model that was there at the time, and GPT-3 had been around for a while, and GPT-2 and GPT, the, the OpenAI folks essentially put this conversational structure on GPT-3, which was called chat GPT, and then, you know, all of a sudden it's exploded to the extent that we're having this panel here. <laughs> Our next question is, is there a high probability of ChatGPT suing for intellectual rights violations three to five years from publication or use of its documents today? I'd say probably be the other way around. People would be suing ChatGPT for misappropriating their intellectual property because after all it's trained and all this data that belongs to other people. else has any uh, we've been recommending all night that you um, you know check and doctor up whatever it outputs so you know, protect yourself against such a potential uh, copyright issue I suppose um, but the the way that ChatGPT responds similar to pretty much all um, generative language models is um, it may seem a little bit vague or generic in the way that it speaks, um, more so than a human would be. Um, and so I think you, you do want to take whatever it outputs and really make it your own if you do use it as a starting point. So um, if you treat it like an assistant and not a, uh, a drudge, I suppose, then you should be protected, hopefully, if such a thing should happen. The next question we have is, if we think of GPT as a six-year-old child, how close are we to reaching a more advanced intelligent system like an adult? So as, as I was saying, I think for that really we need the reasoning capability as well. Now, but that's, you know, so for that you have to model the common sense knowledge and all the knowledge that we possess. So you could say, well, the the big problem that we need to solve is how do we take this, all the knowledge that is there, and somehow convert it in a form that, you know, we can, uh, we can reason with it in a uh, rational way, uh, and not using pattern matching. Uh, so that's, that's a tough challenge. So as I said, you know, for very narrow domains, you can do it, but, you know, building a system that can rival us, um, it's, it's going to take a while. And also keep in mind that, you know, we humans can, um, we can make decisions even in the absence of information, which I don't know how chat GPT will behave if, you know, some part of the information was missing. Um, 
but it's challenging for uh, uh, for large language models to, I mean, basically work on the information that they have rather than the information that they don't have, whereas us humans can also act on information that we don't have or that's not there. So it's, it's going to be a slog, but, you know, researchers are working on it, let's put it this way. I understand the, the computer science motivation for that as a goal, um, but what does it get society? Um, you know, do we need a big machine that has adult human behavior? Probably not. I think that the, these smaller models and specializations um, to tackle problems that our mode of thinking just can't get at um, is a much more productive um, approach for for helping humans um, rather than just just the goal of surpassing humans um, for its own sake. Um, I, I think that these, all of these models require inputs in order to produce their output. Um, currently that input on ChatGPT is provided by the user and there is a lot of research on how best to structure the input in order to ensure that the model is successful at doing a task. Um, and I think that's what Dr. Gupta is talking about when he says that the reasoning behind it needs to still currently be provided by a person. He's working on models that will do that. Um, one of my PhD students came up with, I think, my favorite description of uh, ChatGPT or uh, the GPT family of models is that it's not a brain, it's a mouth. And so we still need the brain. <laughs> that's right. The next question that we have is, can a person input raw data into ch chat GPT or does everything come from the internet? Yeah. Yes, as I mentioned, like for chat, uh, at least for uh, GPT-4, um, it's firstly being pre-trained from the internet data, uh, which are raw data. Um, it's then fine to, yeah, for chat GPT then it's fine-tuned with the conversational data because um, other, otherwise it's not capable of like memori memorizing the conversation history and interacting the way of conversations. And secondly, as I previously mentioned, the people, researchers also do some type of alignment with like instruction training data. Uh, meaning that you give an instruction for one task and the input output for that task to make it adapted to like uh, more um, adapted to what your instructions are and follow the instructions. Yeah. So it's it's not only being trained by internet data. Yeah. So you can you can actually give it some information. So what they call it in context learning or something. It's called. Yeah, that's kind of. It, that, that's part of in context learning and, and following the instructions. But that learning is not then passed on to the next user. Um, so uh, OpenAI does update ChatGPT, presumably with the data they've collected over a larger window of time. But um, the in context learning that Dr. Du refers to is specifically for your current session with ChatGPT. So if you even tomorrow wanted to come back and have it do the task again, you would have to show the demonstration examples again and then start asking it to do your task. And we talked a lot about bas how basically, you know, we understand ChatGPT. And so one interesting question here is what do you guys think about what we could learn about humans from ChatGPT? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think what could be. Uh, Dr. Gupta, I think you've told this story to us at least before that you would be surprised what people feel free to say when they know it's an AI on the other end. That, that's that's so actually there is a good, certainly a good point. less nice side of human nature that is revealed in some of these conversations. That that is true. I mean, when humans talk to a uh, 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 bot, they they tend to be you know. So when we were part of this competition, I mean you see all kinds of abusive stuff and crazy stuff that people will not say to another human 
but somehow they feel free to say to a bard so yeah so yeah she, jessica is absolutely right um, that you know when people interact with a with a bard you know they behave differently it's just i guess human nature i don't know <laughs> well but they're also very deferential to it and that's where you get exposed to um the dark side of things and and um the scammers and fishers and such um who can use gpt to generate much more persuasive reasons to give them money <laughs> I think maybe another thing is it makes you appreciate how good we humans are at things that we take for granted. Um so like in my example before keeping two different people from a news article straight and separate in our heads is apparently beyond the capabilities of the AI, but I don't think it's anything that we would normally congratulate ourselves for being able to do. So I think it really shines a light on what we are um very good at and that that's maybe not something that we should take for granted um because even an ai as powerful and as um human seeming as chatgpt can't do it yeah and you guys talked a lot about i guess human ability to give nuance to answers to questions like you know do birds fly whereas for ai it's a little bit more of a binary it gets more challenging than that so definitely interesting to think i don't know give us a better appreciation for how we reason as well for sure Next question we have and we have time for just a couple more is about OpenAI. So is basically the data that's collected by OpenAI through various machine learning methods is OpenAI selling the data to other companies and if not how can they ensure privacy protection? Uh none of us here I think have insight into the exact inner workings of OpenAI but I would strongly doubt they're selling the data because that's what's currently giving them their competitive edge. So Meta has been trying very hard to put out an open source competitor to uh, to ChatGPT and has so far been unsuccessful. Not that they don't have a model out there but it doesn't perform quite as well. And um I think if OpenAI were to give that data out, they would soon see a lot more strong competitors and they probably don't want that. but i do think privacy is an issue um so even before chatgpt um we nlp researchers have been scraping the web and collecting data and you know in every paper you have your ethics statement where you talk about where you got your data and why you think it's okay for you to have taken that data so for me for example i say something like i collected news articles that were clearly published for someone to read so it's not violating any privacy that i took them and i'm not using them for any commercial purpose um so i'm not benefiting from their uh their writing um but i think that uh it's always a concern that anything you put on the internet could be collected up and how would you ever know right they've collected so much that maybe my blog that is my very personal blog is in there and i could never really tell for sure yeah i mean in that sense they're already sort of you know sharing your data with others by for example you know including your blog in you know crafting an answer to some answer to you know someone you know half way around the world so all yeah they're already uh, sort of you know taking your information and giving it to others Well, it looks like we're just about at the end of the panel. I'll just ask one quick question if one of you wants to just give a quick answer is how expensive is the overhead for in-context learning and is it feasible to have a personalized ChatGPT? Yeah, um I just mentioned the personalized ChatGPT for the algorithm. Um I think currently the price for getting a personalized or Uh, I know some researchers that they uh conduct pre-training uh some type of adaptation of the default chat GPT for their own research and then the open AI have their version uh also stored in the cloud but that's for that that school um but I heard from I I heard from that researcher like is even is now disclosed by ChatGPT uh, by OpenAI uh, their copy of their adapted 
Chat GPT is actually um, is actually low cost because they it's like they adapt only part of the parameters, so it's not uh, it's not super expensive now. But at least they still spend like ten, over ten thousand dollars for uh, only one research project. Yeah. So 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 I think in context learning, I mean at least. For our purposes, I mean, it's incredible. You can give it very few examples, and it's actually able to learn. So, yeah. So, uh, so personalization, I don't know. But uh, if you just, you know, want it to give a certain answer, and you train it, then it's able to do that with very few examples, which is quite incredible. I mean, it could be as few as a dozen examples for something very narrow, just a dozen examples, and it basically figures out what answer it should give you. Well, we've come to the end of the time for the panel, so I want to thank all of our panelists for their responses, Professor Du, Professor Gupta, Professor McDonald, and Professor Oyang, and also UT Dallas for hosting us here, and also thanks to all of you for coming out and asking your questions. Um, we hope you had a good evening, and thank you so much. Good night.